Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joshua White with the Stimson Center, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the New America Foundation uh, for this panel. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as many of you probably know, New America has really been at the forefront over the last several years in discussing uh, changes, particularly in the sort of Islamic political landscape in South Asia, and uh, very pleased that they've taken the initiative uh, today to invite Arif Jamal to uh, launch his new book and to share, uh, I'm sure it will be just a small fraction of his many insights on uh, Lashkari Taiba and uh, the affiliated movement. So we're uh, very pleased to have him here today. Um, also joining us today is Dr. Mohammed Taki <coughs> to my right, who's going to be providing some, uh, some commentary about sort of the wider Islamic political landscape. Uh, many of you know him for being a prolific writer for the Daily Times in Pakistan and uh, one of the real outsized Twitter personalities who regularly comments on what's happening in, um, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the wider region. So uh, the way we're going to, to structure this this afternoon is I'm going to ask uh, Arif to present for about uh, 15 minutes and then uh, ask uh, Dr. Taki to, uh, to respond for about 15 minutes, and then I'll use my prerogative as the moderator to present a few questions, and then we'll open it up to what I'm sure will be a very lively and interesting debate, discussion, Q&A. Uh, so that's where we're going today. And uh, with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Arif to share some initial uh, thoughts about his book. Um, and then we'll get the discussion going from there. Thank you very much. Let me go Please. there. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I thank uh, New America Foundation for hosting uh, me here, and uh, also uh, Josh White and uh, Dr. Taki for uh, coming along. Uh, <coughs> I will be briefly talking about first uh, uh, the relationship between Lashkar Taiba and Jamaat Dawa and uh, their global uh, <coughs> uh, organization. And then I will be talking about their uh, relationship with the Pakistani state or Pakistan army. Uh, my book gives a very rich uh, uh, and detailed uh, context for the birth of this group. Uh, and those who are really interested, they can read the book. <coughs> Jamaat Dawa was founded in 19, uh, August 1987 uh, in Lahore by the remnants of uh, Johamans Ikhwan, the group which rebelled against the House of Saud in 1979 and uh, occupied Mecca, uh, the Kaaba for several days. <coughs> this group was very uh, global in perspective and membership because people had been coming to Mecca, all, the, uh, all Muslims go to Mecca uh, in their lifetimes. and. Uh, uh, that is where they were recruited in the group. <coughs> but after the, uh, the Saudis uh, crushed that group, the remnants uh, spread around uh, the world. And many of them came to take part in Afghan Jihad <coughs> in 1980, the uh, year after the Mecca rebellion. However, they founded the group in '87. Uh, and uh, they uh, put a front uh, of uh, a Pakistani group uh, led by Hafiz Said. <coughs> At that time, Hafiz Said's uh, status in the group was just that of a mudir. Uh, it's kind of office manager. It's not a very elevated uh, uh, status. <coughs> From the very beginning, uh, the, the, the group Jamaat Dawa had at that time name Marquez Dawat Wal Irshad, that is MDI. MDI set up several uh, uh, departments 
and one of those department was uh, Lashkar Taiba. <coughs> Lashkar Taiba was uh, meant to wage jihad just in Kashmir. It they did not have the mandate to uh, wage jihad in rest of the world. For rest of the world, uh, Marquez Dawat Wal Irshad, which was the predecessor of uh, Jamaat Ud Dawa, uh, created uh, uh, the Department of International Jihad, which was headed by uh, Mahmoud Bahazik, who was mostly uh, 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 known as uh, Abu Abdul Aziz Barbarossa. Abu Abdul Aziz was uh, and is actually he is still alive and living in Saudi Arabia. Is the most dynamic jihadist I have uh, come across, and he has done more to spread. Uh, uh, jihadist infrastructure in the world than anybody else. <coughs> Mahmoud Bahazik uh, headed uh, the J Department of International Jihad and he went out to wage jihad in several countries. He fought in Afghanistan personally, he went to uh, Philippines and fought in uh, uh, southern Philippines and he went to many other countries and physically took part in jihad. In 1972, he set up a sub-department of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Department of International Jihad, Muslim forces in uh, Bosnia. The Bosnian Jihad was fought under the name of Muslim forces, but it was an entirely 100% uh, Jamaat ud dawa operation. A lot of experts in, uh, here and elsewhere uh, give credit to Al Qaeda for that jihad, but actually uh, the role of Al Qaeda in the Bosnian jihad was very limited. A few people from Al Qaeda, uh, from Al -Qaeda did participate, but they were under the command of Mahmoud Bahazik. <coughs> the Johamans uh, Ikhwan set up several uh, affiliate, affiliates uh, all over the world to coordinate uh, international jihadist activities and uh, Marcus Dawat Wal Irshad in Pakistan was kind of uh, the uh, center uh, for all those uh, 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 jihadist groups in the world. Uh, <coughs> for example, um, Marcus Dawat Wal Irshad sent uh, uh, aid and uh, 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 fighters in Chechnya, in Tajikistan. Uh, in Uzbekistan, uh, in uh, uh, Maldives, uh, and they have set up uh, units in some uh, 100 countries. And I have uh, identified dozens of them. Uh, they, in all over the world, they work under different names. The idea is that even if you crush Jamaat Dawa today in Pakistan, which is not easy, the party will survive. <coughs> now, briefly, I will uh, now touch uh, upon the relationship between Pakistani state and Jamaat ud Dawa. Marcus Dawat Wal Irshad was set up in August 87. However, there is very little evidence of uh, ISI support to Marcus Dawat Wal Irshad uh, till 1991. Uh, yes. Pakistani state uh, uh, tolerated the group, but then they were tolerating every, every jihadist group at that time. <laughs> in 1991, uh, uh, the ISS started uh, 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 supporting uh, the Pakistani group, which was headed by Hafiz Said, to take over the command of the group, so that they can push the group into Kashmir, where they had already started jihad. Between 1991 and 93, there was a huge uh, uh, struggle, uh, power struggle within the uh, group, and half is supported with the resources and support from the ISI, uh, and took over command in uh, practically in 1994. Uh, uh, ni in, uh, 1994, uh, and uh, the real Amir of uh, Marcus Dawat Wal who was a Pakistani alim. Uh, uh, Allama Rashidi. 
uh, he was sidelined, but most of them, uh, most of his followers, his group uh, and Arabs were sidelined. Uh, Rashidi uh, died in uh, 96 and then uh, Hafiz Sayyid took the uh, command fully. That from uh, that time onward, ISI has been uh, uh, controlling the group uh, very, very closely. And the only objective for the ISI or for the Pakistani military is to wage jihad in uh, Kashmir and some in India. Uh, Pakistani military does not have a global jihadist agenda, but it does have uh, 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 an Indian uh, centric uh, jihadist agenda. But the problem is when they tolerate such groups, uh, these groups uh, usually uh, want to do more than what, they, what the ISI mandate is. And the ISI pays the price of tolerating them and uh, letting them uh, uh, do their jihadist work. The ISI or Pakistani military does not pay uh, fully as a lot of uh, commentators say. They pay only as much as is uh, required to wage jihad in Kashmir. For other operations in the world or even in Pakistan, uh, JUD raises its own funds and now it has become a real, real big, big uh, group. I have calculated that uh, it has trained something like uh, uh, between 300,000 to half a million uh, people. When I say trained, uh, it means that they, these people have gone, undergone uh, basic 21-day training. Now, this is a very, very uh, scary figure and uh, most people would be skeptical. Let me give you a few examples to say that uh, the, uh, the, the figure is not all that uh, uh, unreal. Uh, current, uh, their biggest uh, uh, mass uh, training camp, which is Umul Kara, it was set up in 1992 uh, approximately. And since then, it has been uh, training, uh, giving training to approximately 200 uh, men uh, every week. Uh, at one time, there are 600 uh, boys uh, taking training at one center. And at one time, they had four big uh, training camps in Pakistan and Pakistani Kashmir. jamaat dawa is not just a jihadi group, as we understand. It is a group which wants to run a modern state. It has recruited from all walks of life. Wherever you go uh, to pa in Pakistan, you will find that jamaat dawa members are present in, in that department. They are in the army, they are in the police, they are in the intelligence agencies, they are in customs, they are in among doctors, they are among engineers, they are among uh, uh, all sorts of experts. jamaat uh, dawa holds uh, uh, annual doctors' convention, for example, and uh, uh, they gather something like uh, 600 doctors, medical doctors. And they are not ordinary PCPs. Many of them are the leading doctors in Pakistan, uh, urologists, uh, uh, cardiologists, uh, ophthalmologists. Uh, they have engineers. The, one, of the, one of the strongest uh, uh, jamaat dawa unit is in the Lahore's uh, University of Engineering and Technology, where Hafiz had used to teach Islamic studies. And uh, there, the members uh, graduate, they are not sent for jihad. They are asked to join government jobs. And many of these engineers have joined Pakistan's nuclear establishment. That I have shown uh, uh, in the book. Uh, I have given some names also. <coughs> Then they have, they have units in the, uh, in the ordinary universities. They graduate and they don't go to jihad. They go to other uh, uh, professions. And there they do missionary work. At one time, I think uh, not more than 2,000 boys are engaged in practical armed jihad. 
every time uh, I spoke to JUD uh, leaders, uh, they insisted one point, that they are not a jihadi group as such. They are training themselves to run a modern state, and their boys will be able to take over every job a state does when they take over power in any country. Uh, this is the Jamaat Dawa Central. And then they have uh, uh, affiliates all over the world. And all those groups in the rest of the world, they are also uh, evolving in the same uh, uh, manner. <coughs> Uh, I think I will stop here and uh, um, uh, I think cover the rest uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, New America, and thank you everyone for coming uh, initially. Uh, no financial disclosure and uh, no association disclosure views are my own. Um, <coughs> the breaking news today uh, was the appointment of the ISI director in Pakistan. And uh, General Rizwan Akhtar has been appointed. And there's a nice chapter in the book which says, the wholly owned subsidy of the ISI, Jamaat Dawa. So I guess a lot of you will be asking what happens next. I was uh, sitting in the back room and I saw a little plaque from uh, some years ago where another ISI director had taken over and there was a lot of uh, goodwill and enthusiasm about that particular ISI director taking over because he had trained in US just like uh, General Akhtar has done. That was General Kiani and that was back in 2006 or something like that. So we'll have to see how that pans out. <coughs> I want to uh, segue quickly into the numbers that Arif talked about. Uh, the camp Umul Qara has been producing these uh, hundreds and thousands of people, and at this point, uh, maybe half a million uh, Jamaat Dawa members are under arms. We saw in Islamabad uh, over the last six weeks that less than 20,000 people, less than 20,000 people who are unarmed, untrained, uh, could bring the Pakistani government to a practical standstill. Uh, if a jihadi organization decided to bring any Pakistani city to a standstill like this, for example, Lahore, uh, where uh, next to Lahore is Murid Ke, the uh, headquarters of Jamaat Dawa, I think it will be a very tough situation. So one has to think really long and hard uh, about what the motives of uh, this particular organization are. And like Arif said, um, LET is one of the brand names. You know, if General Motor was the enterprise, I would say this is the Chevy of uh, uh, General Motors. Uh, that's kind of what it is. You know, they make many other models. They have a Cadillac of Jihad also, which is their uh, international jihadist organization. Um, so the idea is bigger and much older than some of the other jihadist groups that have been out there uh, in the market. And uh, by design and by default, uh, individuals and governments and organizations have been setting analysts and uh, counterterrorism experts on a wild goose chase uh, where things which were done by the Jamaat Dawa were actually put into the Al-Qaeda basket uh, to make things relatively easier and simpler for people to assimilate and not worry that much about it. Uh, the uh, gentleman that he mentioned, um, Mahmoud Bahazek, uh, he was the guy who actually led the Bosnian Jihad in 1992. And he, uh, he's called Barbarossa for a reason. Uh, he patterned himself after uh, the Ottoman uh, Admiral Hayruddin Barbarossa. And one of the uh, Jamaat dawa strategies is to encircle uh, India uh, and the uh, Indian and Pacific Oceans, uh, kind of a reverse um, of the uh, string of pearls uh, analogy that the Chinese use something along those lines, starting from uh, the Maldives all the way uh, up to the Philippines. And they have a very interesting name, from, uh, which is an associated group, uh, MILF, M-I-L-F, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. <laughs> so I wish <laughs> somebody brought it to their attention that it might be uh, something that has to be changed. So uh, it, it, is, it is a 
organization which is huge, uh, which has cut its ideal, ideological teeth much before any other organization has done, and it has worldwide reach. Uh, Hafiz Saeed uh, has visited United States, uh, seven states, including my state, Florida. Uh, he has visited UK. Mahmoud Bahazik has been all over the world. And unfortunately, the West and the US still see it as a Pakistani and an Indian problem. For India, it could actually be an existential problem. But the way things are unraveling in the larger Middle East, uh, one has to look at the ideology of Jamaat Dawa as a pioneer Salafi group in Pakistan to think what kind of threat it can pose to the world at large, not just India. So it is not going to be a regional India, Afghanistan, Pakistan problem. Uh, and sometimes uh, groups like uh, JUD uh, like to tactically underplay their strengths and objectives. Uh, they do not want to pick unnecessary battles at unnecessary time. I was talking earlier that uh, back in the day, uh, the Marxist dictum used to be that you don't want a premature revolution. You want to do it at the right time. So uh, whenever the time is right, uh, things might happen that people may or may not like. The question is whether the Pakistani state can rein these guys in, whether the new ISI chief and his outfit, uh, the Pakistani army, uh, whatever relationship they may or may not have, are they in a position, I'm not here to say whether they actually control them or not. Uh, I've written an extensive review of the book. Uh, you can Google it and read it and definitely read the book. Uh, but is that going to be something that we should look forward to? Uh, Arif has addressed that uh, from primary source uh, from the Pakistani army's writing, how they look at some of these groups. Uh, the groups which attack Pakistan only, they're the ones who are to be tackled primarily and with the state might and with the immediate urgency. Then there are groups which attack both Pakistan and US and India, for example. Those are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. And depending upon what kind of carrot or what kind of stick is dangled from the DC area, uh, action may take place. It may take almost a decade, just like we saw in the case of Haqqani Network. But it did happen a little bit, maybe wishy-washy, maybe not as effective, but it does. And then there are groups which do not attack Pakistan. And jamaat dawa is classified as one of those groups which has not conducted operations inside Pakistan. Even the fundamental Salafi creed of takfir is not professed openly by, by Jamaat al-Dawa. Takfir meaning apostatizing the other Muslims to the extent uh, that they are considered uh, liable to murder. This is something the JUD does not do uh, openly. But uh, if you look, read the book carefully, you would see that it has actually practiced takfir in the Indian uh, uh, Kashmir where it attacked Sufi shrines, such as the famous Charar Sharif uh, shrine, uh, Shah Nuruddin Wali's shrine, uh, and uh, a couple of other major Sufi shrines. So it is not that the ideology is not there. Uh, it is probably a tactical maneuver. Uh, and at times, they are presented as a counterweight to uh, the unruly Diobandi uh, militant groups which are getting out of the Pakistani state's hand or attacking, uh, say, for example, uh, the GHQ. Uh, the point is that JUD actually s gained battlefield experience initially with some of those Diobandi groups, such as uh, the Haqqani network. The first battlefield experience that uh, Zakir Rahman Lakhvi uh, got was in the town of Arghun uh, in Paktika. This is the same time, town that was bombed uh, three months back, uh, right around the Eid time uh, when people were shopping and about 80 people died there. This is exactly the same time where Jalaluddin Haqqani started his, his own original campaign back in the August of 1975. Uh, so there has been some cross-pollination, but there is a very slight doctrinal difference uh, that this book uh, very keenly highlights between the uh, Salafism and Wahhabism. And where that has practical relevance to what the policymakers and counterterrorism experts uh, have to do is where exactly do these Salafis and, and uh, Wahhabis differ? Uh, 
for all practical purposes, the, the Salafi groups like Jamaat ud dawa they are not much different than the Wahhabi or the Deobandi organizations, but they take it all the way back to the time of the first two caliphs. And this, this is the pristine Islam that they want to reproduce. This is the caliphate that they want to reproduce. And when they object to the Ubandis or Wahhabis, uh, even in case of, for example, the Saudi state, uh, they think of them as heretics. And therein lies the rub that we look at uh, many things from the perspective of whether the ISI can or cannot control these groups. Maybe they can, maybe they cannot. But what this book does is it actually looks at JUD from its own individual perspective, its ideology, and not the ISI prism and the ISI blinders. I think that is the strength of the book. Uh, this is very important, uh, and I think uh, one of the most important uh, aspects uh, that he is, uh, RF has highlighted is uh, the original primary source work uh, called uh, Jihad in the Present Time, which highlights eight points, uh, some of which actually have uh, a bit of an overlap. and. Uh, at the expense of uh, maybe boring you with that, I'll just have to read those out to you. Uh, the, the points uh, one, four, five, and six are sort of interrelated, so I would I would go through that. Ending the persecution of Muslims anywhere, everywhere. Uh, help the weak and oppressed Muslims anywhere and everywhere. Seek revenge for the murder of a Muslim by a non-Muslim. And here the key is the revenge. Uh, the diet or blood money, as was done in the case of uh, uh, the the, uh, the the spy guy caught in Pakistan, that is something which was uh, not uh, um, ac acceptable to people like JUD. So it has to be an eye for an eye, uh, and then punish those who violate the oaths or agreements uh, with the Muslim governments. So that's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, they develop, and then ultimate goal, uh, like he mentioned is establishing not just uh, a, a small uh, fortress uh, somewhere, but an, an actual caliphate, a state, um, replicating the state of Medina. But they don't go back all the way, although they claim, uh, going back to the times of the prophet, they actually stop short of that, and they move towards the time of the first two caliphs. They don't even consider, the uh, within the Islamic context, uh, the four rightly guided caliphs are supposed to be you know, the revered ones. But they, they discount the last two because that is considered the time of strife. And they look at the, the prime of Islam as the expansion of the, uh, the empire in the time of first two caliphs. Uh, and uh, one of the points related to that is the recapturing of those lands which were once under Muslim domination, which includes Spain and India. So that's the gist of the, uh, the JUD ideology. Now, why is it problematic uh, to have groups like these as uh, tools of foreign policy uh, persecution? And I would say that uh, since the 2001, the uh, JUD had a very clear anti-US agenda. It came out uh, with a clear-cut fatwa, a decree from its uh, Darul Ifta, which is uh, the house that issues decrees in support of Osama bin Laden, in support of the Taliban in Afghanistan, despite their uh, doctrinal differences with the Diubandi Taliban and relative differences with the Osama bin Laden. And despite that, they were well tolerated by the Pakistani uh, security establishment. And not only that, they were given battlefield access. And as the, uh, the uh, war in Afghanistan, and I'm talking from uh, after October 2001, it started picking up, the Indian presence in Afghanistan was used as a pretext where these groups which had consorted before and JUD back in the first uh, post-Soviet uh, um, Afghanistan war, uh, it had a huge presence in the northeastern Afghan states of Nuristan and Kunar, which were under uh, Salafi influence and they actually had established a Salafi state under the leadership of a guy called Jamilur Rahman. And those camps were inherited by JUD after uh, the collapse of uh, uh, the, the Mujahideen regime. And uh, they maintained the Taliban kicked them out, but then they had access to that. 
So once again, these groups were brought into contact with the Diobandi groups like the Haqqani network. And as late as uh, the swearing in of uh, Indian Prime Minister Modi, where the Indian consulate in Herat was attacked, uh, the blame was again laid at the door of JUD. Uh, and uh, most likely in conjunction, the access was, was provided by one of the Diobandi groups. So they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And the problem arises when the states use these groups uh, and they spin out of their control. Uh, we all know that. It has happened before. Uh, the Pakistani uh, security establishment has used both secular and uh, um, uh, doctrinal ideological jihadist groups in Kashmir. Uh, Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, uh, whose original founder, one of the original founders, uh, came from my hometown of Peshawar. Uh, that spun out of uh, Pakistan's control. Another layer was created. The Afghan Mujahideen, the first seven parties, they spun out of uh, uh, the control and another layer was created. It does happen. It has happened with the Saudis also. Uh, the, um, uh, in the early 20th century, the uh, Saudi Ikhwan rebellion against the House of Saud was a, was a prime example of why there can't be two centers of power. Because within the Wahhabist and Salafist doctrine, and, and that is right from the uh, uh, text uh, of uh, Abdullah ibn Wahhab that there can be nothing but one ruler, one authority, one mosque. That is the crux of the Salafi creed. And this is where things become more relevant today. Uh, after 1979, uh, to be precise, November 20th, 1979, which was the Mecca rebellion, that was Muharram 1st, uh, the year 1400 in the Islamic calendar. So uh, this uh, millenarian uh, tendency had existed in the Saudi Salafis and Juhayman al-Utaibi, who was uh, uh, one of the key ideologues, he along with the promised Messiah, he took over the Holy Mosque in Kaaba. And as Arif mentioned, some of those uh, people were captured and killed, including uh, Utaibi, but a lot of them survived. And JUD uh, happens to be a direct extension of that creed. And now what we are reading today is that ISIS in their core curriculum is teaching what? The letters of Juhayman al Utaibi and the text from, uh, original text from Abdullah ibn Wahab. So I'll just quickly s stop here that there's so much in this book uh, which is relevant to uh, what is happening today and why it is not just a regional problem. Uh, presence in 52 countries, uh, going on from Maldives all the way to Philippines, uh, Australia, US, uh, you remember the paintball uh, jihadist plot uh, here in Virginia. Um, the, the reach is there. Uh, three or seven of uh, uh, the brothers of Hafiz Saeed and, and one of his uh, comrades, they were imams in US, including in Boston. How? Why? Uh, who's dropping the ball? Where? Uh, are we being um, taken for a ride by an English-speaking, um, cigar-smoking, scotch-drinking general somewhere uh, who might be saying something in a language that we don't understand? Is, is, there, is there a problem? I think we need to uh, really introspect. So uh, that's my spiel for today. Do buy the book. Highly recommend it. If you want to read my review, you can look it up on the Google. Thank you. Thank you, babe. Thank you both for uh, very provocative comments. Uh, and it, it leaves me with this image of a uh, Scotch drinking general in a Chevy uh, driving somewhere in South Asia. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is open up uh, by asking our, a couple of questions that take what is a, a very rich book full of historical material and ask him to think out a little bit toward the future uh, in two areas that I think are uh, areas in which he's highly qualified to do so and I think there's also interest by those of us who think about this movement in terms of what it means for, uh, for policy decisions. Um, in the first place, the book traces in some very interesting detail the early leadership struggles of, of this movement and the way in which Hafez Saeed eventually comes to lead the movement. And so I wanted to ask uh, Arif if he could 
uh, look to the future and imagine what scenarios, what situations, what events might precipitate either a leadership change or some fragmentation of leadership uh, wi within the, the broader movement, uh, which I think he quite correctly identifies as, or labels as, uh, as MDI, JUD, but which we would commonly call Lashkar Taiba. And I think this is important because there's been a lot of speculation here in Washington about whether there might be parts of this movement that take on a different agenda than the core. So the first question is, uh, what would it take to see that happen? The second question has to do with the broader premise of the book, which is that this is not a movement that is localized to Pakistan and India, but one that has deep roots in the Gulf and has broadened out uh, throughout um, th throughout the world, from the UK to Bangladesh, the United States, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and you know, it's very interesting how the book traces this uh, sort of globalization of the movement, looking at Chechnya and other places. But it strikes me as I, as I read it that however dispersed the group may be, and however broad its recruiting network might be, the target set has actually been rather consistently narrow, uh, with the exception of some of the group's early engagements in Afghanistan, um, perhaps some activity in the Maldives, a foil plot in Copenhagen. By and large, this is a group that seems to care about going after Indians, and that the sort of anywhere, everywhere uh, motif broadly applies to, uh, to Indian targets. So again, the question looking to the future, is this a movement that may eventually truly broaden that sense of who needs to be targeted? And what would it take to see that change come about in the group, given such uh, a long history uh, focusing on India as a, as a state and as a, a people group that need to be challenged in South Asia and, and more widely? So I'll ask Arv to address those questions. Uh, and then <coughs> I'm going to open the floor to your questions. I, I think people can hear. Uh, okay. Um, first, uh, lead. Uh, well, uh, the the MDI and JUT people are very well uh, trained in the doctrines, and their belief system is such that uh, once you join the group, once you uh, go through 21 day training, where Actually, you don't learn much of uh, using Klashnikov, but, but the ideological uh, doctrines. And uh, during those 21 days, you basically learn or accept to kill and die in the name of Islam. And uh, once you undergo that training, I see that it's almost impossible for anybody to leave uh, the group. Uh, they have been. Uh, uh, some uh, groups, uh, uh, half a dozen, a dozen people leaving or being uh, uh, pushed out of the group. But the group has remained v very solidly intact. And I don't see, even if you eliminate the entire lead uh, JUD leadership today, the group is likely to uh, stay united. And uh, I don't see, uh, honestly, uh, any fragmentation happening in this group, uh, particularly. <coughs> also, uh, the affiliates work in such a way that if you eliminate one group, the others will survive. Because you don't know who they are working under, uh, under which name and where. In, in, even in Pakistan, uh, let me give you an example. Jamaat Dudawa runs something like uh, 1,000 so-called secular schools. As I said, they want to run a modern state, not madrasa-led uh, state. And they own only 200 sta uh, schools, which are named as Adava system of schools. Adava system of schools only, uh, uh, the enrollment in the Adava schools is almost 50,000. 50,000. And there are 800 other schools which we don't know uh, uh, under which names they are uh, working. <coughs> the second uh, point was uh, um, the 
targeting and how they, they're a global movement, but their targets have seemed to be rather uh, Yes. Uh, actually, lashkar taiba became uh, famous or uh, known because uh, over these years, lashkar taiba was doing jihad in India, and only Indian media was talking about it. Uh, the rest of the world, unfortunately, ignored the group. And whenever the group was involved in any jihad, for example, in Bosnia, the world unfortunately gave, gave credit to Al-Qaeda. As I said, I have shown in the book that uh, the Bosnian jihad was an Jabhatu Dawa jihad, not an Al-Qaeda jihad. And, but the world gave credit to Al-Qaeda. That is why we don't know much about their uh, jihad in uh, Bosnia, in Chechnya, in Tajikistan, in uh, uh, in, in Philippines, for example, we, we don't know that in Sudan uh, they, they are un, uh, working under which name. Jamaat Tudawa is very much present in Afghanistan, in Kunar and uh, Nuristan uh, along the Pakistan border. They are, they, they are virtually under their control. Uh, so, so we do actually, we don't know much about uh, their global activities and that is, I, this is my first attempt to show that. Let me give you one example when uh, Dr. Taki was talking about their doctrines. Uh, one of the doctrines of uh, Jamaat Dawa is that, they, that all Muslims should wear jihad to take back the lands which were once occupied by Muslims. They, they have, uh, I think, eight or ten uh, doctrines uh, to wear jihad, to justify jihad. And America, according to their doctrine, was once uh, occupied by the Muslims. There is an article which shows that at one point Muslims had come here to rule, although, although they could not, but they did get, come here. Since they came, now it's duty for the Mahatma Dawa to take back this land for Muslims. I, I can see the faces. <laughs> But that is what their doctrine says. And there are so many other uh, very, very uh, interesting docu uh, uh, doctrines that we all need to study. Can I quickly add? I'll just quickly add to this that, uh, you know, sort of like uh, the Trotskyite notion of a perpetual revolution or uh, something along those lines. Uh, you start with 1979, you have the Juhayman's Ikhwan. Uh, and right uh, before that, in 1978, we had the uh, Saur Revolution in Afghanistan. And uh, the remnants of uh, Juhayman Zikhwan, uh, including Bahazik, uh, were moving to Afghanistan, and they were waging war there. So this is this is the uh, 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 late 20th century first major jihad where the Salafis are getting involved. Then from that point on, they moved 1992 to Bosnia. From 1992, uh, major jihad in, in Bosnia. They moved to uh, Chechnya, 94-96. Uh, they are working. This is JUD working with uh, Shamil Basayev. Uh, in uh, Chechnya and uh, logistic support or uh, whether actual uh, participation, they're there. In, uh, again in 1996, uh, they are back in Afghanistan. Then uh, 2001 onwards, they're in Afghanistan. And some of the uh, areas uh, that we talk about, the Nuristan and, and Kunar, which are uh, the areas under the Salafi control, they're o they also happen to be the areas where uh, Pakistan claims that the, uh, the uh, TTP, the tariq -e taliban pakistan leadership is, is there. I'm not insinuating anything, but uh, the question is whether those areas which are out of the Afghan government's control, uh, is there any sort of uh, consorting going on between the uh, tariq -e taliban and uh, JUD in those particular areas? Because uh, Nuristan, uh, in particular, um, and um, they, they have been the hub of the JUD activity. Uh, and then uh, the uh, fundamental, uh, as um, uh, one of the Taliban used to say, that uh, you have the watch, but we cut the time. Uh, that is something that they're, they're patient people. Uh, there's very little impatience uh, waiting for the right time. And if you look at it, uh, incrementally, it has been becoming more sinister, more violent. And uh, the culmination now is uh, in, uh, in the form of uh, Iraq and Syria. The ISIS uh, is uh, the, the prime Salafi example that we have. And uh, the problem is, uh, it's not a question of when. It's, uh, uh, it's not a question of if, but when. And, and um, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, I think in, in my own view, those would be the two 
uh, two countries uh, which could potentially be hit by a very significant rift between the former uh, Salafi Wahhabi proxies uh, and the state itself. I would just say I saw in the news that a JUD spokesman in Pakistan came out with a very forceful statement against ISIS or ISIL or whatever we're calling it today. Uh, did that statement surprise you or did it not surprise you? Uh, no, that doesn't surprise me. Um, and but we, it, it, it's too early to see how things will uh, uh, evolve in the coming months and uh, years. Actually, how I see is that uh, 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 most of the jihadist forces in South Asia and Central Asia, particularly in Afghanistan, will coalesce. What we see, what we have seen in the last ten years, is that the Durbandis, which were initially not takfiris, have become takfiris and uh, the takfiris have become more radical and uh, the, dis uh, the, the ideological difference uh, between uh, uh, Taliban who were Deobandis and uh, the Salafis is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, uh, narrowing. Uh, Fazlullah who heads the tehreek e taliban Pakistan is ideologically a lot closer to, uh, to Hafiz Said than to Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, so um, I see a lot of uh, 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 forces coalescing, and the same uh, trend uh, will probably be happening in uh, uh, in the Middle East. But one thing is also sh uh, uh, sure that there are a lot of uh, Johamans Zikhwan who are joining uh, the ISIS uh, in the Middle East. Now, now how do they uh, uh, handle the situation in the Middle East? Middle East? We, we, we don't know. Uh, it, it's too early to, to foresee, but uh, probably there may be two caliphates or maybe there may be one caliphate. Uh, well, there in history we have seen two caliphates coexisting very peacefully in the Middle East and in South Asia. We, we don't know how this situation will evolve, but uh, um, the scary thing is that I see a caliphate in South Asia coming in next few years. Uh, Pakistan can implode any time, and the only jihadist group which is ready to take over is JUD. On that optimistic note, I would like to, to <laughs> open the floor to questions. Uh, we do have a microphone, and I'm going to ask that you ask a question, and that it be one question, and that it not be a statement. Uh, and with that, we'll start with the woman here the, in the striped shirt. My name is Benazir Shah. I'm with Newsweek Pakistan. Um, in your book, you write about how Hafiz Said had a personal relationship with Osama bin Laden. They were constantly in contact when he was in Pakistan. How has that relationship between Jamaat al-Dawa and Al-Qaeda changed uh, ever since OBL was killed, since both these groups are Salafi groups? Uh, let me remind you that uh, Jamaat al-Dawa, IMDI, was uh, founded by Johamans uh, Ikhwan uh, remnants. Now, uh, Johamans Ikhwan was the first real international global jihadist group, not only in its membership, but also in its vision. Johamans Ikhwan did not want to occupy uh, just Saudi Arabia, but they had a global agenda because they thought Mahdi had come and this is the time to take over the whole world. That is uh, what the Muslims believe, I mean Sunni Muslims believe. Now, th that belief system has, uh, 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 has been borrowed by uh, the JUD. However, Al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden was not against Saudi monarchy in the early years. S Osama bin Laden and some of his uh, 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 colleagues that turned against the Saudis in mid-1990s. However, there were some uh, remnants of Juhayman and Zikhwan in the Al-Qaeda uh, or Osama bin Laden group. So there also we, we see uh, the, uh, the two groups uh, ideologically uh, coalescing. Uh, the, n the new uh, statement of Al Zawahiri uh, shows, we do not have much of evidence, but it shows that uh, uh, 
uh, Al Qaeda or whatever is left of Al Qaeda is coming further closer to JUD. And I see uh, uh, them cooperating more and more in South Asia. Now, the most important thing in Ayman al Zawahiri's uh, uh, statement for me is that the countries he mentions, for example, Myanmar, Bangladesh, they are the countries where JUD is heavily present after India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. So, that is very significant. Uh, why he chose Bangladesh and Burma uh, to mention? I think it is because of uh, the two groups uh, cooperation somewhere. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan Abbas, National Defense University. Uh, congratulations, Arif. Um, Thank I you. look forward to reading the book um, very soon. I have two questions. I promise it'll, those will be very brief, Josh. Uh, first is about do you think Lashkar Taiba and JUD can convert into a political party at some stage? When will they make that decision? And what do you think will be the response? Where will they place themselves in reference to Jamaat Islami, Jamaat Ulma Islam, and so many other religious parties? Where will they develop their coalition or, or alliances, um, if you think? And second is, um, as a teacher, I would say, when I have to teach my students, I always say, look for credible sources. Tell us something more about the sources of your book. Um, is it based upon interviews? And I know of your extensive journalistic background and linkages. Who are the people you interviewed? Which are the books, their publications? So what, what are the major four or five sources uh, of all that you're telling us? Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I don't think it will ever become a political party in the sense uh, even Jamaat Islami of Pakistan is. Uh, although after 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, they started uh, posing as a political religious uh, party, but I don't think they will ever be uh, even like Jamaat Islami, which is in my view a terrorist party. Um, second, about sources, yeah, uh, I have, um, my sources include in-house publications, uh, uh, a lot of interviews, uh, uh, Hafiz said, uh, I have interviews Hafiz said dozens of times and I have published dozens of interviews uh, with Hafiz said uh, in question and answer form in Pakistan. Uh, I think I was the first journalist who interviewed him and published in English in 1976 or 7. Uh, and that was uh, uh, when he was not really Hafiz said. And uh, when he learned that some English newspaper uh, person is coming to him, he was really overawed. <laughs> and um, I have been to all the uh, training camps, uh, lived there for days. Uh, uh, it was very difficult. If you ask me to do again, I won't be able to do that. Uh, but then again, um, it was my passion to work on them. Uh, so I, I have thousands of interviews. Uh, very closely watch them evolve into what they are in the last 20 years. Can I, if I could just ask a follow-up question, because I thought that Hassan's point was very interesting. Uh, why would this movement, why would Jamaat Dawa not want to enter the political process? They have, they have um, joined street movements with the Defy Pakistan Council uh, in engaging on public issues. They have a broad-based network that involves both a platform on a number of public issues plus an extensive service delivery component which could could make them and could provide the framework for a uh, for the sorts of things that successful political parties do uh, what do you think would be the the logic uh, within the party for rejecting that move into the political space actually uh, primarily it would be because of the doctrinal reason uh, the doctrine is that um, you cannot even impose uh, 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 the uh, Quranic laws uh, through parliament. Because if you say, if the parliament of Pakistan says Quran is the only law in Pakistan, even that is not acceptable to them. Because it's the parliament's law, uh, uh, word which is imposing uh, Quran in Pakistan. That is not acceptable. And they, they say it has to be the Amir, the Amirul Mu'minin, who has to say Quran is the uh, law. Yeah. Um, going back to that, why they would not 
it would be very hard. Uh, Hafiz Saeed actually got the battlefield experience along with Osama bin Laden in the Battle of Jaji in the Loya Pakhtia region in 1986-87. Uh, Osama was uh, so impressed with him, he gave him uh, actually his jeep. Uh, I don't think that we have seen many Al-Qaeda actually turn into political parties. And then the fundamental doctrinal issue is, like he says, Amir means doing something by order. If you go to the Arabic root, root word Amr, which is by decree, uh, there's very little political process involved in that. And the experiment with the DPC, uh, the Defy Pakistan Council, which was actually a conglomerate of various uh, <coughs> Uh, different ideological uh, parties and, and some groups in Pakistan which was propped up against the previous uh, Pakistan People's Party government uh, was an engineered project uh, basically to bring street pressure upon uh, the, the Pakistan People's Party to, uh, to acquiesce to certain demands that the Pakistani security establishment had. So it was not truly an evolutionary pro process in the sense of a political party evolving, such as even Jamaat Islami, uh, which had a, a strong uh, uh, ideologic doctrinal base, uh, membership base. Uh, this is a party which has uh, Jamaat Dawa is an active jihadist group, n uh, quite unlike, yes, I tend to agree with Arif that uh, Jamaat Islami has. Uh, active terrorism uh, acts under its belt right from 1979 onwards. Uh, but for JUD to move towards uh, a mainstream political party would mean that everyone in Pakistan actually subscribe to uh, their Salafist creed. And that is where the problem with the Salafist and Wahhabist creed is. Uh, the takfirism uh, excludes anyone and everyone. And even within their own groups, they have such fundamental uh, disagreements um, that it's, it's, it's such a straight line that uh, mainstream Pakistanis would find it really, really hard to actually subscribe to the thought process. Uh, we saw that, uh, that in Saudi Arabia where uh, even uh, people like uh, the, the chief cleric bin Baz actually took on the Saudi uh, monarchy. And then we have the Salafi uh, arch uh, um, ideologue uh, Albani. Uh, who basically um, did takfir or apostatized even the Wahhabists. So you have a group um, you know, which is exclusivist within the exclusivists. Uh, and for them to go out and become mainstream, I don't think that I would see that happen in my lifetime. It probably would happen in certain pockets somewhere. And there is an actual push. Uh, there is a book out there by uh, a scholar, uh, Humaira Iftadar, which talks about uh, Jamaat al-Dawa and Jamaat islami actually becoming uh, the secularizing influences on the Pakistani society. God knows how <laughs> actually you go about doing something like that, but uh, worth actually checking that out. Uh, My name is Suleri. I'm from the Embassy of Pakistan. Now one question. Uh, you talked about the 21 days course that takes place in Jamaat dawa and it appears to be a uh, very well-crafted uh, course which converts a person within 21 days from someone who... Uh, do, do you hear me, sir? No, okay, all right. Um, uh, you talked about the 21 days course that takes place uh, at uh, Jamaat dawas headquarters which converts a person from uh, uh, the one who had some other ideas to some uh, radical ideas within 21 days. So it has to be a well-crafted course. Do you have any access to what kind of that literature is? Why? Because, in your own words, the the people uh, who are joining are from different uh, 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 walks of life: doctors, engineers, computers, and scientists, etc. So, w what is there in that that it converts very well-read and uh, uh, you know educated people uh, into something different within 21 days? Yes, I have very clear idea about that. Uh, before 9/11 uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, uh, everyone uh, could freely go to those uh, camps. Uh, uh, there was no bar. You, you see, the problem is uh, uh, for the world they are terrorists, but for, for uh, Jamaat Dawa people, they are not. They think they, what they are doing is part of their religion. That they are doing it as uh, part of uh, their religious duties. So they they have nothing to hide, and they never hid that, and they don't hide it even now. Even now, they can t they take any journalist, uh, any researcher to their uh, camps and show them uh, what they are doing. Uh, now, the problem is that foreign journalists uh, uh, 
are suspected sometimes that is why uh, 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 there are problems, uh, but otherwise uh, uh, their vision is very clear. In those uh, days, uh, you see, when, when they recruit somebody, there is a time. They, they, the, the person bef uh, who is recruiting uh, somebody, he teaches him something and then he shows something. But when he goes to attend a camp, when a, a, a somebody who, who, who has nothing to look forward to in life, that is what the mass of JUD uh, people are, uh, when he holds the Klashnikov, he feels empowered. And that empowerment makes him uh, a lifelong follower. The power Klashnikov gives to everybody there in the camp. I have seen people changing in over, th over three days, drastically th changed. And, uh, and then after 21 days, they have read uh, some parts of Quran and some hadith uh, which, uh, which are suitable for them. And then they, don't, they, they are not abandoned. They, after 21 days, they are, take, they are taken to their uh, local village or city or neighborhood uh, 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 units. And there they are further trained. So that is how, and you know, Jamaatul Dawa holds thousands, or maybe tens of thousands of uh, training camps and meetings in one year in Pakistan. That's amazing. One unit, they are always un under training. They are always under training and missionary uh, uh, work. Hafiz Said did not s sleep in his bedroom for years and years and years. He used to sleep in his van because he was traveling from Karachi to Peshawar and uh, he is giving a lecture in Karachi, then he is traveling in the van in, uh, after two hours uh, to another unit he is giving a lecture and that is many of them uh, uh, did. I would I'd, I'd just like to jump in because I think it is a very interesting uh, comment and um, can you, you've been watching this movement for a while, can you speak a little bit to the socioeconomic uh, ba basis of the people who you believe are joining. I mean, there, there's one view that said, well, look, they have outreach to doctors and lawyers, and <coughs> journalists and engineers. Uh, that's certainly a middle or upper middle class kind of socioeconomic profile. Uh, we read other things that say, well, these are the, the poor, impressionable, destitute who have nothing to look forward to until they hold that Kalashnikov in their hand. Uh, what have you seen uh, in terms of the kind of people who joined the movement, and has it changed since the 1990s? Um, <coughs> in the beginning, uh, briefly, the, found, the Pakistani founders were madrasa trained, uh, or were affiliated with, with madrasas. Uh, Hafiz Said and uh, Zafar Iqbal and uh, Hafiz Maki, they are not uh, madrasa trained, but they were teaching in madrasas. But other uh, founding members, most of them were mothers are trained. But, but the Ahli Hadith uh, did not allow them to use their madrasas because Ahli Hadith in Pakistan were associated with the, the, with the Saudi government. And the Saudi government did not like uh, uh, any of them, if they wanted funds from Saudi Arabia, to be associated with Juhayman's uh, uh, Ikhwan. Now, what happened after that? they started recruiting from different walks of life and they set up uh, units, uh, labor, uh, labor's unit, uh, uh, doctor's unit and they started recruiting from all, from, uh, from every walk of life and uh, they succeeded in most. However, most of uh, the, the, the members uh, uh, were from the uh, very poor, impoverished uh, families. Uh, who had really, really, really little uh, uh, in life. I have done a study with uh, Christine Fair and uh, Don Dressler on fighters. Uh, it's I think uh, fighters uh, of Lashkar -e Taiba. It's available on uh, online, and uh, that is the study where we we, we have shown the uh, we use the published biographies of uh, JUD martyrs, and you will see 
uh, uh, you will see the uh, socio-economic uh, background of those who died. But those who die are not exactly the representative uh, of the group because doctors, the JUD doesn't send doctors to fight because doctors are needed elsewhere. Uh, they don't send engineers to fight or, and die because they are needed elsewhere. So they, businessmen, they, business, there are a lot of businessmen uh, in the group. They don't uh, send them as a policy to fight, even when they want to. Can I quickly sure. add to, to this? Uh, short courses are, are not uh, unique to jihadist organizations. Military organizations do that. Uh, there is National uh, Cadet Corps in Pakistan, for example. Pakistan Army used to run a, a short training course at Mangla at one point, uh, OTS Mangla, as it used to be called. Um, from your own travel agent, you may know the taste of Italy uh, trip. You would go for a day or two or something, and the next time you may end up going for, for 10 days. Uh, this Dora Amma, or the uh, initial course, is an introductory course. There is about eight or so more courses uh, which they go through. Uh, but what I wanted to touch is at the broader milieu in which these people or the general Pakistani population is being primed. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. In the first two years of med school, I read anatomy, physiology, and uh, biochemistry, so many other things. But two other uh, subjects that were taught were Pakistan studies and Islamiyat. Now what in the God's name you have to do with Islamiyat uh, in a medical school? And that is the curriculum that is being fed uh, to every Pakistani from day one. Uh, in this audience, uh, it is it's a small world, I have uh, two of my classmates uh, from Pakistan Air Force School who know exactly the curriculum that we read. Uh, and our houses were divided in the school. We had Khalid House, Qasim House, Saladin House, and Iqbal House. And three of these are military men. And then there is Iqbal, who is actually the military ideologue. I'll read you one Farsi verse of Iqbal, uh, which is very commonly used. Half of it is used. And it says, har mulk mulki maast ke mulki khudai maast. Any land which is my lord's land is my land. What they don't tell you is the first line that Iqbal said. This is uh, uh, the uh, Tariq. Uh, that was another house in our school. Tariq bin Ziyad actually landing at Gibraltar, burning its board, and everyone said, what are you doing? And what he said was, Khandidu dasti khesh bashamshir burdu guft har mulk mulki maast ke mulke khudai maast. He laughed, he took his hand to his sword and said, any country which is my lord's country is my country. This is the ideology that you are actually grooming the Pakistani kids with. This is the doctors and engineers that you are grooming through Pakistani schooling system, secular schooling system. And it's, it's a massacre of history that is taking place there. So I'll just stop short of that. And then from that point, you introduce them to whatever uh, Dora Yama and Khasa, which is like a uh, commando course. Okay, question here. Hi, my name is Matt. You've taken a large view with JUD, but could you please comment on any similarities, differences, or convergence between the Haqqani network and LET? I didn't get the, question. the question was about any uh, convergences between the Haqqani network and LET, or to unpack that, that relationship. Uh, uh, so far, we don't see that. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the jihadist forces in that region are uh, coalescing, have been coalescing, and may further coalesce. I think that may come or may not come. Uh, but Haqqani network is basically for Afghanistan. And uh, I think in the beginning, yes, they will uh, coalesce. But they, uh, if one group has to dominate, survive, it would be JUD. Haqqani, Haqqanis won't survive. As far as Afghanistan goes, there has been a certain overlap in the Haqqani network and the JUD. And uh, a lot of the operations conducted against the Indian uh, interests in Afghanistan, um, which I mentioned, Herat Consulate, there was an Indian embassy bombing as well in which uh, the blame was laid actually at uh, JUD and Haqqani Network doorstep. Uh, Haqqani Network is fundamentally a, a Diobandi organization, and they come from the uh, Madrasa, which is uh, about 40 miles from my hometown of Peshawar. But uh, where there is op operational need, there certainly is an overlap, and uh, things, you know, they can make things happen. I believe there's a woman in the far back on this side. No, there's a, a woman in the far back. Hello, my name 
my name is Khadija Kamar. Thank you for your discussion today. My question was regarding whether or not, uh, back to your discussion previously on whether or not uh, Hafiz Saeed was aiming towards political legitimacy. And I think that his statements in the past year and some of the interviews indicate that he's more publicly open about his position. Last year in the New York Times, he said, we need to create a political option for Kashmir instead of a militant option. So I was wondering why you think that um, LET's doctrinal evolution doesn't indicate that it could also have a political evolution. Because you said previously that you think the doctrine is so severe that they couldn't have some form of political vying for a political party. But I think their past has shown that they're doctrinally evolutionary and that doctrine is at the service of politics and not the other way around. Uh, if I uh, understood your question correctly, uh, actually what I meant was uh, uh, it will not be a political party in the sense other parties are. Uh, JUT is trying to pose as a political party, but then they also say that their politics is, is Islam. Uh, I think it was basically a strategy to survive in the post 9-11 period when uh, there was clamped down whatever uh, that meant at that time uh, on jihadist groups. Uh, uh, have I answered your question? Let, let, me, let me just ask a, a quick follow-up if, if I could. Um, this is an organization, particularly if you speak about Lashkar Taiba, that has focused very significantly on Kashmir, both in its rhetoric and its activities. Uh, how does the organization see uh, its engagements in Kashmir today as the, the political environment has uh, certainly a very dynamic in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, from your reading of their current statements or literature, your observation, how is their view of their activities or their agenda uh, or their approach changed over time with respect to Kashmir? Theoretically, theoretically they have not moved from their um, initial positions on anything. And uh, they say that tactically they have uh, uh, retreated a little. Uh, in Kash the Kashmir Jihad is uh, fully funded by the ISI. Everybody knows this is not something uh, secret anywhere in the world. And uh, when uh, 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 and when they uh, want to uh, curb them, they curb them. Uh, after 9/11. There was a lot of pressure on Pakistan to curb these jihadist groups in Kashmir, and they did. Secondly, there was a fence uh, between the two Kashmir that created a lot of problems for Mujahideen. Uh, and the result was that they started sending uh, 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 their boys to, in, uh, to, uh, uh, to India proper. Uh, what I have been trying to say and, and said in, in the book is that. Uh, IS, uh, ISI, uh, Pakistani military, has a very limited uh, agenda, and that is Kashmir. But the jihadist group, all of them, have far bigger agenda. And the tolerating those uh, jihadist uh, groups' agenda is, is what poses uh, 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 the real threat to the world. There's a question. Yes. Thank you, Josh, and uh, panelists. I'm Rahul Osmani from John Hopkins Science. Uh, uh, very interestingly, I hear, I mean, being from South Asia, your discussion scared me a little bit of the future of uh, South Asia, given the compli complexity of the uh, GOD. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, we can uh, see the, the footprint of the West, uh, led by the US and Afghanistan, is uh, being uh, produced. Uh, and the, the West and the U.S. is encouraging a regional solution for, uh, for, the, for Afghanistan and the South Asia. So with the threat you see from GUD, that you said the government of Pakistan is also unable to uh, control them and they can overthrow the government of Pakistan any day. So how you see that who in the region should uh, lead this uh, solution, finding a solution or bring stability uh, for for South Asia as a whole, if you see Pakistan itself as a you know has a tr big threat, and that threat can can go and expand to any country in South Asia. I mean Afghanistan as an example. So how you see the future of that? 
situation with the waste uh, having a limited footprint there? Briefly, I don't think uh, one single country can uh, tackle this problem. Pakistan or United States or India. I think uh, the whole world will have to seriously uh, uh, pull in resources and uh, uh, efforts to, to fight this uh, threat. Uh, because even if you eliminate JUD Central, the problem is still there. However, the real problem is it comes before that. And that is how to stop Pakistani state, in other words, Pakistan army, to, to, to use jihad as an instrument of uh, uh, its defense policy. And Pakistani uh, 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 military has used jihad as an instrument of its defense policy since 1947. It has never, never stopped uh, doing that. How to stop that? Unless you 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 uh, uh, stop that, you cannot really fully uh, fight uh, uh, the jihadist group. But then you, you can't really stop uh, fighting uh, just because Pakistan is not doing enough. Uh, so uh, we have to do that and uh, uh, be uh, remain remain optimist. At some stage, we will win. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Tariq Parvez from Pakistan. Uh, first of all, uh, let me compliment you on writing on such an important topic. Uh, my, uh, I'm just trying to be uh, clear about the transformation of uh, LET from a regional terrorist organization to a global terrorist organization. My perception was that it's probably uh, regional. Uh, I would be interested, my question is, uh, whether there have been any attacks or any attempts uh, to carry out terrorist acts by LET in the West. Uh, I'm not talking of Bosnia and Chechnya, those are two different, uh, another dimension altogether. But I was just looking for some concrete evidence to... In the West. To, uh, yeah. Uh, whether there have been any specific incidents or attempts. Thank you. Um, actually, first, uh, the JUD or MDI did not become uh, from a Pakistani group in, in, into a global group. Actually, it, it was vice versa. A global at an international group called Jhemen's Ikhwan became a Pakistani group and then became international again. Uh, well, uh, there is no uh, incident where they uh, succeeded as such, but uh, after Bosnia, they had planned to go to, uh, to Italy. They had um, uh, 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 there are some hadiths which say that Muslims will uh, conquer uh, Ottoman um, uh, uh, Roman Empire, and after such, uh, they had planned to go, to go into Italy to conquer Rome because that is what they thought uh, 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 God asked them. Um, in other uh, in other places, they had planned like the Lodi incident in Australia. Uh, they had planned but had not succeeded. And I think... Uh, the Virginia Paintball Group? Hmm? The Virginia Paintball Group here? Uh, yes, uh, he, here also they tried, but they did not succeed. Uh, now, how the Virginia uh, 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 Group was uh, actually cobbled up in London. The London branch of uh, JUD introduced American jihadists uh, and Hafiz said in London and then uh, uh, they planned there. I think uh, no court documents show that. My book shows that uh, uh, how uh, it was uh, the plan was made in London. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the spiritual leader of American jihad, Ali Al Tamimi, uh, was uh, uh, in London uh, uh, with Hafiz Said where they planned. And, and some of the people, like the shoe bomber, for example, has, has uh, gone through their training camps. 
and in certain incidences, uh, the plans were aborted, like the Yellen Poston uh, uh, attack was planned, but eventually not carried out uh, by JUD, and the guy who was supposed to do it kind of got disillusioned with their technical restraint. Yes, yeah, but you see, that is where the JUD has become a supermarket of jihad. You, anybody can go and get training and, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, come back and start jihad. Uh, I would not say that uh, if somebody goes to get trained uh, from JUD, comes back and do, uh, does jihad, that's not JUD agenda. That's an important distinction. Very good. Um, sir, in the back. Tom Timberg, consultant, and actually this leads into my question, which is, uh, what about dropouts? 500,000 people have gone through <coughs> the training, but do we have, and a number of them have then gone on to careers or moved abroad or come back to the United States. Uh, <coughs> how many of the people go through the course and then drop out or even are alienated by it? Uh, really, I don't have any numbers. Um, uh, whatever I know is in the public domain uh, from the newspapers. Uh, uh, they don't really announce uh, when foreign uh, trainees come to their camps, they don't announce. Uh, uh, and that was not of much interest to me either at, at any time. There aren't many. There's a woman here in the front. Thank you. Your um, fascinating, excellent presentation. Um, Jacqueline Rose here. You mentioned um, some, uh, in passing, some claims being made that uh, Muslims came to the U.S. and therefore it's the duty to go back and conquer the U.S. Uh, could you? expand on that in as much detail and as many places and groups that are claiming that as you can? I've read only in one article, a long article on America, in one of the JUD publications, uh, uh, because their doctrine is that uh, you have to fight uh, uh, jihad to take back uh, uh, Muslim lands. And uh, they showed that uh, at some point, uh, uh, I think four or five hundred years ago, some Muslims did land uh, in America, and uh, they they wanted to establish a Muslim um, establish Muslim rule here. How um, uh, how correct their historical uh, sources are, I really don't know, uh, but that is what they believe. Uh, so uh, my knowledge is uh, limited to their belief system. Oh, please, please wait for the microphone. And my question is, uh, Mr. Nakvi, you said you are from Peshawar, and let's say that you lost your relatives uh, in drone attack. Uh, would you call that American uh, sponsored state terrorism? Similarly, let's say that you have relatives in Gaza, and you lost your relative where Israel killed 2,000 people just for a couple of uh, citizens. So what do you call state-sponsored terrorism? And similarly, in India, there are 70,000 Kashmiri who have lost their lives. So is that state-sponsored terrorism, or it's a, it's, it's a problem of al-Dawa or these uh, uh, Islamic parties? And my question to you, sir, is this. Please, uh, please just please. one question to each. No, please, just <laughs> okay, one question, thanks. sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So the question is whether I would call, well, I have lost a lot of friends. No, just well, let's let's just talk about personal experience. I lost eight friends in one bombing, about two furlongs from where I grew up in the city of Peshawar, in which the IG, the Inter Inspector General of Police, Malik Saad, who was also a good friend, was lost. That bombing was carried out by the Taliban. So it is very close to my heart uh, what I talk about, and it is. The question is, uh, which Arif alluded to, whether using such groups as instruments of foreign policy or national security, whether that is something that can be conducted in this day and age, or at some point the Pakistani state has to take a step back and realize or understand that whether they can go on rationalizing the use of such proxies and forces which backfire, 
which hurt. Uh, we have lost great officers. The Pakistani officer, uh, General Sanaul Nazi, was a wonderful officer. Uh, we have lost uh, General Alawi, uh, again a wonderful officer. Uh, so it is not necessarily uh, that one is just blaming the Pakistani state for it's sometimes it's the wrong diagnosis. Some, sometimes it's a bad prescription, and I think it's a question of uh, the state to take a deep inwards look and realize whatever has been going on up until this point, whether this is something which is viable in future or not. Give you the final word. Uh, very briefly about drones. Actually, this is not the topic today, but I would like to speak about it. Uh, drones are not t state uh, terrorism. They are not. Uh, uh, it's not terrorism. Uh, killing terrorists with drones. First, Pakistani civilian government and Pakistan army has have approved those. So it's cooperation between two states. Uh, okay. First of all, secondly, if uh, killing Hakim Ullah Masood is uh, terrorism, then I support that terrorism. If you think that uh, uh, 20 people who died uh, with one terrorist were not terrorists, I'm sorry, tell me what the hell what they're doing with, with Hakim Ullah. You see, why, why do these terrorists are using human shields? They, they, they are part of the groups, so they are not terrorists. The, first, f the most important thing for your point of, uh, from your perspective should be that Pakistan, both civilians and military, approve that. Thank you. I would commend to all of you the book, which you will find outside. And I think, as you've heard from the conversation today, uh, does a tremendous job of tracing the evolution of a movement that we often tend to see as static and also the global dimension of a movement that we tend to see as quite localized. So for those reasons and others, and for his uh, tremendous remarks today, I'd ask you to join me in thanking both of the, both of the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.